disruption. I will outline the steps, which are step one, um, we'll identify the disruptive persons, and step two, we'll inform them of the existence of this policy. Step three, if the disruption continues, um, those responsible would be asked to leave. Step four, if the disruption continues, we'll consider options to reconvene elsewhere. Step five, um, we're taking measures to ensure that the event can be reconvened with, without disruption. And step six, if the interim measures do not work or are insufficient, then we'll consider um, contacting the external authorities. Okay. So tonight you're invited to follow us online. Please tweet your questions or comments using at UT or hashtag men's issues, men's, uh, hashtag UTMIAS or hashtag male suicide. I'm Denise Fong. I'm moderating tonight's event on behalf of the University of Toronto Men's Issues Awareness Society. And I want to thank you all for joining us tonight for suicide and men, why depressed men are dying for someone to talk to. This is the second event of our two-part event series uh, focused on mental health and men. The first event was about violence and sexual abuse against men with Lynn McDonnell that was held earlier this month at the UT. And both tonight's event on suicide and that one are, are part of the UT's uh, overall focus on mental health this month as October is the university's mental health awareness month. So um, I'm just curious, is anyone here for the first time? Oh, wow, <laughs> welcome. Um, we try to host an event monthly on campus, and I would invite you to sign up um, for emailed event notifications with me at the end of the talk, or um, at reception just outside the front doors, and to receive a schedule of our events for the semester. Our goal at the UTMIAS is exploring gender equality, areas of gender that are um, understudied in contemporary culture and um, identity and responsibility in our society. That leads us to a current focus on the status, health, and well-being of boys and men, where attention, investment, and support for educational and social programs currently stands at a level that is far from ideal. The UTMIAS has the objective to explore the seriousness of this problem and to see what consequences may or may not arise for our society. The event tonight is sponsored by the Canadian Association for Equality, uh, a charitable organization with a goal to provide up-to-date evidence-based research, education, and information through inclusive conversation and intersexual dialogue through a comprehensive discussion of the facts. No ideology, special interest agendas are promoted. One of the Canadian Association for Equality's most recent projects is establishing the first Canadian Centre for Men and Families in Toronto. And I'll just introduce their director, Justin Tronte, to you now to talk a little bit more about this exciting endeavour and um, also briefly about the Canadian Association for Equality. Smoothly so far. 
Um, I also want to, of course, thank our speakers today, Ara and, and Julian, for taking the time out of their busy lives and um, uh, talking about this sensitive and really important topic with us today. So we're very appreciative of that, and of U of T in general for making October Mental Health Awareness Month and dealing with these important topics. So a little bit about um, the Canadian Association for Equality. Uh, we are, uh, we've been around for a couple of years. We're a registered educational charity with a focus on uh, men's uh, health and welfare issues. Uh, we do that through a variety of means. Um, we put on these events on campus uh, and on other campuses as well. We sponsor events um, throughout Ontario, in fact, uh, working uh, together with uh, student groups at a variety of universities and colleges. Uh, we also do research and public policy work. And I'll point out there's a document um, on yellow paper, so it's easy to find, on the tables outside. It's an infographic that we prepared the facts about suicide in men. So I encourage you to check that out. It's one of the products that have been, that's been put out by our research and public policy committee. So I encourage you, if you're interested in volunteering, that's a particularly important committee of CAFE. But we also do multimedia. We're active on YouTube. We run a podcast. Um, and uh, we do uh, blogging as well. So there's a number of ways you can get involved uh, through the events, the research, uh, or the multimedia, if that interests you. And I guess the newest and most exciting project is, uh, Denise referred to it, uh, is the Canadian Centre for Men and Families, which uh, has been operating for a couple of months now as we, as we build it and set it up and uh, recruit volunteers. But we will be officially opening to the public, though, in a couple of weeks, with our grand opening on Sunday, November 16th at 3 o'clock. So I encourage you to come out to that. But in any case, in November, we will be open for business. We will be starting our programs. We will be doing things like um, therapy for men, uh, discussion groups, mindfulness meditation, employment counseling, and a wide variety of other programs that we will start to introduce over the course of the next few months. So very excited, very new uh, kind of agency, rather unprecedented, I think, in Toronto. And we're, we're very uh, proud to, to bring that to you. It's also very close to both U of T and Ryerson, uh, so it's definitely a place for students to come and get the help that they need. So I won't say too, too much. I just want to remind you again that we are uh, always taking volunteers, always encouraging folks to sign up. If you don't want to uh, volunteer or become a member yet, you can just put your, your email down and get uh, updates on events like these and other exciting things that are happening. Um, the next thing we will be doing is actually tomorrow. We're going to have a Halloween party at the Canadian Centre for Men and Families. So if you have a few hours uh, tomorrow evening, you can come out uh, between the hours of 5 and 9. So for those of you who have kids, you can join us perhaps before you go trick-or-treating or perhaps after, um, after you put the kids to bed. So a couple options for you if you want to come out and, and hang out at the center. Um, the center, the last thing I'll mention, we do have a new website um, that we've just launched. Uh, and on that website, you can get all the information you want on our programs, our events. You can register for these new programs that we're launching. So that's the website there, uh, www.menandfamilies.org, menandfamilies.org. So take that down, and uh, you can get more information there. All right, thanks very much for being here. And I'll turn things back to Denise. Thank you, Justin. So tonight, MIAS is pleased to present this public talk on suicide and men in partnership with the uh, with speakers from the Canadian Mental Health Association. Now, before I introduce our respected speakers tonight, I just want to say that personally, I feel that this is a sensitive topic and also a vital one. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to help host a talk on suicide with the UTMIAS, as I've been looking to raise awareness. Uh, around this issue for a very long time now. Suicide is an issue that affects everyone, men and women, in society, from all ethnicities, cultures, and backgrounds, and as such a major cause of premature and preventable death. I'm not a researcher, but I'd like to share with you just a rough picture of the numbers. In 2009, there were 3,890 suicides in Canada. That was five years ago, and it ranked as the second leading cause of death among Canadian youth after car crashes. It still does, and research shows that mental illness is the most important risk factor for suicide, that more than 90% of suicide, people who commit suicide have a mental or addictive disorder. 
depression is the most common illness among those who die from suicide, with approximately 60% suffering from this condition. But here's the climax. According to Stats Canada, no single determinant, including mental illness, is enough on its own to cause a suicide. Rather, a suicide typically results from the interaction of many factors, not only mental illness, but marital breakdown, financial hardship, deteriorating physical health, a major loss, or a lack of social support. And now here's my question to you. Do you feel that any or all of these factors would be major contributors to why the suicide rate for males is three to four times higher than the rate for females? Stats Canada states that there are approximately 18 male deaths versus 5.3 female deaths per 100,000 people. And today we are focusing our attention on why this is currently the case. We want to know what male suicide in particular tells us about our current society. Although according to Stats Canada, the much higher rate of male suicide is a long-term pattern in Canada and not just a current phenomenon. Suicide in men has been described as a silent epidemic. Epidemic because of its high incidence and substantial contribution to how men die generally, and silent because of a lack of public awareness. The BC Medical Journal has published about this, but not many other publications to name of have. So what were their suggestions for breaking the silence? Building public awareness. And in British Columbia, that would be a start, as suicide is one of the top three causes of death among men aged 15 and 44. Internationally, except for China and India, males show a suicide rate that is 3 to 7.5 times that of women. So tonight, we hope to provide an explanatory framework and further insight on these figures. This will ultimately help us implement future preventive measures and strategies for male suicide and hopefully a brighter future for men in our society. So, let me introduce you now to our speakers, Canadian Mental Health Educators for Youth Wellness and the Canadian Mental Health Association, Era Amy Eyre and Julian Bucklow. I'll let them tell you more about their backgrounds and their important work. And then after um, their talk, we'll have a discussion when we'll be able to take your questions or comments. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Once again, as I mentioned before, we invite you to follow, follow us online during the talk. Please tweet your questions or comments using Twitter handles at U of T, at Men and Families, at Equality Canada, or any of the hashtags you see on the board behind me. Um, please join me now in welcoming Era and Julian to the University of Toronto tonight. Okay, so they told me to use a mic, but I have a really loud voice, so if I'm making any of your ears bleed, I'll just take it off, okay? So just keep me in a loop. They claim I need one. I'm, I'm not convinced. Um, this is not, there we go. Okay. Um, okay, so, uh, sorry, I didn't know that we would have access to a projector tonight, so the copy of our presentation that I have on me is a you-specific one. Uh, however, it follows all the same principles and steps as our adult presentation. Um, but you'll see that it's youth focused in its imagery. Um, so thanks for having me. I'm Ara. I work for the Canadian Mental Health Association of York Region and South Simcoe. Um, I've been in the field for 24 years um, and uh, primarily have worked in criminal justice and uh, mental health. Um, spent a lot of time working in jails and courts, prisons and detention centers. Um, also in support of housing for people who have a hard time maintaining housing. Um, and then I was on the mental health and justice team working with young people who are charged, uh, who have a mental health issue. Um, we come up with a diversion process that includes treatment uh, so that that young person charges can be stayed. And now I'm on the youth wellness team, so I do education uh, sort of anywhere from grade four up to university age. Um, historically at CMHA, uh, our program ran for 10 years and we never received a single request for under grade nine. 
Um, and in the last three years, uh, that has grown and mushroomed exponentially, including these younger grades, um, where uh, we, has, we don't have expertise with the younger crew. So, uh, but just to give you some perspective, from a mental health agency angle, uh, you know, back in the day we mainly treated adults, then we finally included youth, and now what we're hearing is that kids need assistance as well. Um, it's believed that the vast majority of mental illnesses begin in childhood and adolescence. So if we became more proactive as a culture around responding to youth distress, uh, we think that we could probably prevent some of the longer term uh, emotional and mental health stuff that, that happens when young people don't receive care. Only about one in five young people in Canada do receive care for mental health. So uh, this suicide rate, you stole a few of my lines, by the way. I was like, why did I guess and then say all these facts? Uh, but anyway, uh, what, uh, what was mentioned was that uh, suicide is the second leading killer of youth in Canada. So that is ages 15 to 24. Uh, within the general populace, we're averaging around 4,000 suicides. Uh, it's interesting in my position because I keep expecting to wake up and the Toronto Star will have a headline that says, suicide is a Canadian epidemic. You know, multi-policy task force to be formed immediately. You know, and I wake up every day for 24 years and it's not on the cover of the star. And I can't quite figure it out because I can't understand how in a country that has health care plans, that has uh, sort of socialist roots around supporting community members, that we find that an acceptable number in Canada. Um, also among our Aboriginal communities, we have incredibly high suicide rates. And I believe currently right now, there's a town uh, in the Northern Territories that has the, currently has the highest suicide rate in the world. Housed right here in Canada, where we sort of walk around bragging about our health care a lot, right? We're like, oh, those silly Americans, we've got it all figured out, right? Uh, what we have found is that um, we are doing better. We are moving towards uh, recovery models for mental health. The vast majority of people who report mental illness uh, do recover. We have very good recovery rates. Uh, medication has improved. Our approach to recovery has improved. And so with all that knowledge base, it's sort of unacceptable that we're still struggling so much with the suicide piece and we're letting so many people go. So I'm thrilled that you had us here to talk. Um, what I'd like to go through with you is some of the symptoms that we tend to see for people before uh, or as they're sort of developing depression or suicidality, just to let you know sort of what it looks like. Uh, and then we're going to go through the steps of what you can do to assist somebody to intervene. Um, we are really trying to increase and support a network of peers in Canada that can assist each other. Um, you know, there's a notion that we have that if somebody's suicidal, we can just drive up to a merge and open the door and that person will be safe and cared for, right? Um, we have admission rates much lower than 50%. So uh, the vast majority of people that at least work up the courage to go to emerge and say, I'm worried about hurting myself, are often met with indifference. And that's from um, the medical model, um, which has so many resources to offer people in that scenario, especially around keeping people safe. So our goal in getting out and educating people is that you all feel more empowered to know what to do when it comes up. Uh, currently in Canada, one in five Canadians will develop a mental illness. Uh, one in three will develop a mental illness this year alone. So our mental health rates are going up, which is a global trend um, and has a number of probably contributing factors that we're still sort of wading through. Um, uh, but our, our goal is that um, by talking about suicide, we can stop talking about it as a sensitive issue. It's an issue that's claiming 3,000 Canadians, so let's put it out on the table. And the research shows that, in fact, when we use the word suicide with people that are struggling, um, that they actually, the risk level goes down. People improve when we use words that are very direct and clear. Like, do you feel like killing yourself? Do you feel like harming yourself? Do you feel like committing suicide? 
Um, and so, in fact, a lot of our, our historical fear about putting suicide on the table, because we have fears that we can make somebody get worse, perhaps, um, the research has shown that, in fact, talking immediately starts to reduce risk levels. Okay? So let's go through a bit here. Um, the other thing I want to mention to you is, and you'll sort of hear it as I go through this, um, I developed uh, depression and anxiety following my son's birth 12 years ago. So I had 32 years of really good mental health, nothing to be concerned about, other than a wacky hippie family, you know, and a bunch of step parents. Everything was fine. Uh, and I got pregnant, I took some fertility drugs, there's a real strong connection between hormones and mental health for women. Um, really got very, very ill, um, and despite the fact that I go out and tell everybody else to ask for help, I hid it. Um, I got very, um, I had a lot of thought distortion, so I was convinced that, that somebody might take my son if I tell them that that's how I'm feeling. Uh, so I sort of started a journey of mental health recovery 12 years ago that I've been in the process, and we're both going to talk about our personal experience with mental illness as well. Um, and I'm pretty not shy, so if you've got some questions that you've always wanted to ask somebody who has a mental illness, but you've been too worried about it or worried about offending, go for it, okay? So, uh, symptoms of depression. What we tend to see right away is changes to physicality. Um, so often people fall into one of two groups. They're either going to start eating a lot more, so we're going to see a weight gain. Uh, in my case, depression and anxiety shut down my appetite instantly. So within the first six months, I had lost 50 pounds without even trying. And so that was a really good indicator for my family that something was up, right? Uh, sleeping too much or too little. Um, and of course, these are when they're different than what you understand is the regular for that person. So if you have a friend that cries at Kleenex commercials, tearfulness might not be a good symptom to look for, right? So you have to kind of contextualize with the person a bit. Um, but we often start to see people uh, talk about being stuck to their beds, uh, can't get out of bed, will start missing school or work. Um, uh, often, also around the fatigue, what we see is a uh, decline in hygiene. Um, when you're depressed, taking a shower is like the equivalent of climbing Mount Everest for some reason. It's a very uh, un 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 unique illness, and um, so you'll start to often see people's uh, change in people's grooming habits, like shaving, the length of their hair, um, maybe an odor. Uh, difficulty concentrating or making decisions. What we've learned is just the presence of having a mental health issue actually sort of confuses your neurology a bit. And it makes it hard uh, when you are depressed or you're struggling with anxiety to come up with answers, to make decisions. Um, people often sort of express being overwhelmed, uh, feeling like a list of two or three things is too much. Um, sort of uh, excessive guilt. So. Uh, often the lines that we will hear from people are, um, I'm an awful parent, I'm an awful spouse, um, I'm not a good employee, I have not lived up to my um, goals, that kind of thing. Um, and then what we tend to see is an increase in irresponsible behavior and or sort of reckless or risky behaviors, uh, which has a direct correlation, of course, with how people are feeling internally about themselves and that. So you might start to see uh, a real pattern of truancy starting to happen at work or at school, um, showing up late, uh, sort of a, a disconnection from the work or an inability to follow through on a task. Um, often, uh, and this is specific to men actually, we will often sort of hear from guys uh, a preoccupation with death and dying. Um, so uh, a lot of talk about sort of mortality, and the meaning of life, and um, uh, music, lyrics, poems, that kind of thing. Uh, also under the risky behaviors could include uh, self-injury of some sort, so cutting, burning, picking, scratching. Um, it could be unprotected sex with multiple sort of unknown partners, um, but just sort of a general disengagement with sort of 
what they were doing before. Um, just out of sort of clarity's sake, you know, people always say, when should I talk to a doctor? Like, when do I know I'm depressed versus just having a bad week, right? So uh, the way that we sort of talk about mental health is that if you've got some good mental health going on, you've often got a sensation of balance in your life. When issues come up, you feel like you can respond to them, that you have some resilience and some flexibility. Um, you get up in the morning and you get the things done that you want to get done that day. Um, and you're good at advocating for yourself in situations. What we tend to find when people are sort of into uh, perhaps an illness is that we start to see all of that stuff sort of fall away. We see people who uh, are having trouble getting to jobs, to work, having trouble parenting, um, having trouble with finances, having trouble staying housed, um, etc. I feel like I'm just talking at you guys a lot. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, so um, what we tend to find, uh, obviously, with a great number of people who struggle with suicidality is some sort of original trauma issue. And we used to have this idea that trauma was sort of a capital T experience and it had to be big. And we now sort of understand that trauma is really personal and individual and that there are many experiences that we go through in our lifetime which may have some permanent sort of impact on um, our reactions or on our understanding of the world. So, uh, often uh, what we are hearing in suicide intervention kinds of conversations are um, people feeling uh, like they have not um, gotten over some early experiences of bullying. That's coming up a lot, a lot, not just with kids, with adults, a lot. Um, I worked with a 36-year-old recently who could relate the beginning of her distress to an experience when she was eight in a playground experience. Um, we've also got a lot of people with financial strain right now. Uh, a huge lack of affordable housing. Um, so people have some really reasonable stressors, right? Um, currently, SSRI, so, so uh, antidepressants are the number one prescribed medication in the world. Um, so there's something going on where we're all sort of struggling and trying to figure out how to feel okay and what to do when we don't. Um, so, most often when people get to us and are in that space, it's a real, uh, everything has come to the surface at the same time. We've got a whole bunch of contributing factors to this person's distress. So, um, some of the, uh, the risk factors include family history. Uh, I mean, genetics is a piece of the puzzle. Um, just that, just a piece. It doesn't mean that you will develop a mental illness if your parent or grandparent has, um, but it probably means that you have a higher risk of it. Um, also, uh, I have to, the, the reason teen years is there is because um, schizophrenia usually develops in the teen years. Often with boys sort of 15, 16, and girls 16, 17. Um, so just that particular period of life uh, is in a higher risk category because of the onset of schizophrenia. Um, <clears throat> what we are understanding more and more is that there are a whole bunch of physiological things going on when depression is taking place. Um, often um, levels of serotonin and melatonin, which are naturally occurring chemicals in our brain, right, can be off, uh, which can affect our mood. We have a really high level of seasonal affective disorder in Canada like most other frozen countries. <laughs> um, so uh, there are those kind of risk factors. Um, the other thing is there are a number of physical uh, conditions which can cause mental health-like symptoms. So for instance, like hypothyroidism can cause delusion and hallucination. Uh, we had a young man who was suicidal and um, hearing voices, and we got him an MRI, and he had a, a benign brain tumor that was pressing on the part of his brain that was causing that to happen. 
Um, so the, the, the first recommendation that we always make is if you can get that person to see their family doctor, that's a good start. We want to rule out any physiological stuff. Um, and um, I think you've probably heard in Robin Williams' case, there is talk of two factors. One is that, is that, is that Parkinson's, one of the side effects of Parkinson's is often depression. The second was that the medication that he was on um, had some risk of uh, increasing depression. Um, so we also have situations like that quite often where people, I'll give you an example, people go in and get diagnosed with depression, they're given an antidepressant, it turns out that they have bipolar and the antidepressant actually produces a manic state or a really depressive state. Um, so. Uh, it's something that if you if you consider medication as part of a recovery plan, it's really good to have a good doctor to be doing that piece with. Oh, we're just gonna skip the quiz. Um, all right, so just just for examples of lines that you may hear, uh, I can't do anything right. I can't take it anymore. I wish that I was dead. No one can help me, and everyone will be better without me. The last one's really important because one of the sort of classic myths of suicide is that it's a selfish act, that it was done in isolation of any thoughts for your loved ones. And what we really find over and over and over again is that it's the opposite. Most of us that get into suicidal feelings feel that our suicide will be a relief to the people who are caring for us. So we feel like we're a burden on our kids, we feel like we're a burden to our spouse, we feel like we're a burden to our siblings and our parent, like whatever it is. Uh, but in fact, in, in most cases, it's not, uh, it doesn't originate from a selfish notion, it originates from, I want to give this, I, I need some relief and I want to give my family some relief. Okay. Um, I wanted to tell you, there's an amazing website called the Jack Project website. Uh, and it is a young man who uh, was a, a, a first year student at Queens um, and uh, I think had a minor history of depression, but nothing sort of jumped out. Uh, off he went. His parents sort of expected him to be successful. He'd had an okay time in high school. Something happened and Jack developed some depression and he ended up completing a suicide. And so one of the things that Jack's parents did, they, they do a bike ride to raise money and they have this website that's amazing. But, um, oh, I lost my thought, sorry. Right, so the, what the parents did is they went back and they, they interviewed people at Queens about their son and if there was anything in retrospect that anyone would have done differently had they known the outcome. And that was really interesting was the main symptom that people could identify for um, Jack was that he was a really outgoing extrovert and he lived in res and he kept his door open all the time. He liked people stopping, saying hi through the hallways. And the two weeks before he died, he had started to close his door. And that's just a very little tell, we call them tells. Um, but in, in uh, Jack's case, it was a really distinct turnaround from his normal presentation. And so um, it was very interesting to sort of hear these kids talk about it from, oh, I didn't realize that was going on at that time. Um, and interesting video if, you're, if you want to look it up. Um, one of the things that's popular with guys, which is really lovely, is that often uh, people will show up and give things away. So I'd like you to have my iPad. I know you've always liked it. I'd like you to have my iPod. I'm using I every bit. <laughs> uh, whatever it is, uh, that is sort of one of the things that we uh, see. Um, we see a lot of sort of self-loathing and self-hatred. People can't sort of see the, you know, that this will pass. It doesn't feel temporary to people. It feels like a permanent state. So, um, in terms of starting a conversation, our sort of rule is, uh, if something's going on in your gut that's telling you something's hinky, uh, go with your gut. 
the worst case scenario is you're going to be wrong, right? And, and they can let you know that. Um, but we find that what happens most often with suicide is people get that gut feeling and then they dismiss it because of their uh, discomfort about talking or approaching somebody about suicide. Okay, so we, we lose that opportunity. So, uh, a good way to start is, I've, simply I've been feeling concerned about you lately. Um, I like to give people examples, so I will say, you know, uh, Jane, I've been worrying about you lately because you're usually, um, you usually show up in like a new outfit every week and you take all this interest in fashion and lately you've just been showing up in jogging pants. And I just wondered, like has something happened or changed for you as it related to your mood? So I like to give people like an example of what might be sort of making me concerned. Um, the other thing that I do is, even if I've just met that person, I'll pick something out of something that they say and I will say something like, um, I'm really invested in seeing you survive because it sounds from everything you've told me that you are a survivor. So even if I have to sort of do it on the fly, I will talk about my intention and my um, desire to see them make it through so that they feel that they have at least one person who's looking for that outcome. Uh, really good to do uh, normalizing. It's okay to feel this way. This happens for people all the time. Uh, the research does show that statistically uh, almost every person will have one suicidal thought in their entire lifetime. Um, it's not unusual. It, it, uh, it's a reasonable kind of question of mortality that comes up for people. Um, and so we, we really like to, sh to, to normalize it. Nothing wrong with feeling suicidal. Nothing taboo about it. Um, and then we like to, um, to remind them that this is temporary. That although it feels like it will never change, that it's temporary. Um, <clears throat> and I speak to that from my own experience, uh, which is a nice feature in my work now to be able to say to people, I have been in that place and I promise you, it does change. Okay. So what we tend to do now is we try to get people to contract with us for periods of time. So um, around a safety plan. So I might ask somebody, I would like to stay with you until 8 o'clock tonight, at which time the next person is going to take over. Do you agree that if you get worse or you feel like you're at risk of hurting yourself or others, that you'll let us know when we go to the hospital? Like I'll negotiate those pieces. Uh, the other thing that I do is I really recommend that you treat mental health exactly the same as you would treat cancer or heart disease or diabetes. So if someone is struggling, whether it's depression, anxiety, mania, psychosis, um, you know, one of the first things I start with with people is, have you had anything to eat or drink today? Like, I just start with the baseline. And I, um, and I say things to people like, I'm really sorry to hear that you're struggling. What can we do to try to find ways to help you to feel better? Um, it's really an act of compassion, no different than you would do if you baked a casserole and showed up at the hospital, you know, for something, right? So, uh, reviewing and risk and asking questions. So, the most important question, are you thinking about, are you having thoughts of suicide? Do you have a plan? The plan question gives us a bit of an assessment of where that person is on the suicide sort of continuum. Uh, most people do not get to the place of a plan, and so we know if we're getting to the place of a plan that it's more serious, the risk level's going up. Also, if somebody has a plan, we can ask, um, have you um, gathered supplies for that plan? So that we also know if we're dealing with a risk of medication or weapons. Um, I, uh, it's not on this page, but um, we also start to make a list of resources, support people, whether that's um, through an agency, you know, formally or informally with friends and family. Um, my safety plans include what can I get for you to eat? If there was one thing you could eat right now, what would that be? Um, I, it might include um, can I run you a bubble bath? For some people, I show up with you know, the inquirer, for some people, crossword puzzles, um, for some people, uh, music's really critical, um, sleep, 
So um, we are going to put in all sorts of comfort measures as well. Uh, we're not just holding on. We're, we're sort of trying to stabilize and settle down and comfort, okay? Um, we discussed the option of going to the hospital. That's always uh, the best safe place to go if you feel like the risk is high. Um, you may need a backup plan though, as I said, if they don't admit your friend. So what's gonna happen if that happens? Who can come and help you? Um, our main line of defense with suicide is to not leave anyone alone. Um, it's in the alone moments that, that suicides are completed. So um, hospital's an option, uh, a crisis line is an option. Uh, on Hotmail, uh, if you type suicide into the search bar, it will come up on the National Suicide Prevention page, which is an American-based service, uh, but they take calls from Canada, which is great because we don't have a national crisis line in Canada. Um, what's awesome about this particular feature is you can tell them if somebody has written something on Facebook that, that freaked you out, made you worry, they actually go about contacting that person and also support staff in that person's city or country. So it's a really good resource to have if you're seeing suicidal stuff on social media, which is often where we see people's intentions put these days. Okay. Uh, safe use or no use of drugs or alcohol. Um, alcohol uh, is a real serious risk around suicide because it, it, it impedes our um, judgment, our uh, impulse control goes down, um, and people can make quick decisions when alcohol is involved. So we, we try to negotiate no booze or drugs, but if we have to, what, what, are, what are we doing and what are the limits and how are we going to keep that safe? Um, and then linking to resources. Uh, in Ontario, we do have crisis beds. Um, they are 72-hour stay beds. Uh, they're different sort of in place to place. But it's a nice option, um, A, if the hospital won't admit or if your family member or friend doesn't want to go to the hospital. The crisis staff can keep that person safe. Um, <clears throat> in some crisis beds, that stay can be extended, and it also gives people the option to kind of take a time out from family uh, where maybe the crisis is percolating, you know? So, uh, <clears throat> and they don't hover, they just uh, keep checking in to make sure people are okay. Um, family doctors are doing the vast majority of. Um, prescription writing for antidepressants now. Um, we have a real lack of psychiatry available in Ontario, even less in like Durham, Peel, and York. Uh, so people can wait two, three, four years for psychiatry. Um, so family doctors have become that person, uh, but they, they became that person sort of through default. So every GP has a different level of, of knowledge based on what they've sought out for themselves. Um, some of the other things that we do, because medication is just one option, uh, we do a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a cognitive uh, model um, where we help people retrain around thought processes. So we deal with thought distortions, we deal with um, sort of uh, the mythological narrative that we all write for ourselves. Cognitive behavioral therapy helps us to start um, Assessing people's strengths and coming up with strategies to manage anxiety and depression. Uh, the other thing that we're using a lot right now is mindfulness. Um, it's funny because cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectical behavioral therapy, and mindfulness all really originate from a Zen Buddhist sort of philosophy. And um, I, I'm kind of amused actually that the stuff that's the oldest turns out to work the best. Um, but for a lot of people, the latest research on CBT uh, is that for a lot of people it works just as well as an antidepressant. Um, <clears throat> so it's a really good option. Mindfulness is a process of learning to be present in the moment, trying not to spend half your day in the past and half your day in the future, uh, which makes depression and anxiety worse. Um, and we work 
uh, with people. So for instance, in our agency, we have employment supports, we have housing supports, we have vocational supports, we have occupational therapy. Um, so we really work to support the wholeness of a person. Um, it's not just the old kind of way where people just sort of show up and we hand them a pill and say, off you go. Um, we really try to um, work on the context of people's lives to reduce the crises and do some stabilizing. Um, and I think that's pretty much my portion. Um, <clears throat> that number is the U.S. Uh, National Suicide Prevention Hotline. Mm. And just one final note. Um, our suicide rates in the gay, lesbian, bi, transgender community are really high as well. Um, <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> you know, being able to know your local LGBT service that you can refer a friend to who's struggling with issues around sexuality or gender or identity is really helpful as well. Um, and then, are we taking questions now? Can't remember. Yeah. Questions now or after? After. After? after? Good. Okay. I have to wait for you. <laughs> <laughs> instead of committing suicide now is to complete a suicide. And the other term that we're using is that person died by depression, from depression. Um, because it puts the focus on the illness as opposed to the person's reaction. Um, so just consider that in your own talk with people, um, that we're sort of trying to change that language. I'd just like to thanks, thank you, Eric, for that informative discussion. That was really good. So I'd like to give you guys a different perspective on uh, suicide and depression, because not only does it, 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 affected, it affected me directly with suicide, not only once, but twice in my life. Uh, I also went through depression. And so I'll, I'll start you on this journey through my life and uh, how I started with CMHA. So my role as a peer support specialist for CMHA in York Region, and I work for the EPI team, which is the early psychosis intervention uh, for people. And basically my role is to give support for people going through early psychosis. And so I went to York University, that's where I reigned from. I went to Fine Arts Cultural Studies. And then afterwards, after getting my BA, I went to Seneca College for Social Service Work. So it all began when I was a young kid. Me and my brother are probably the, the bestest friends in the world. We used to play pranks on each other. We used to create home videos. We used to talk with each other. We used to be you know, the best of friends, right? And when I was about 12 years old, um, my grandfather, committed suicide, or completed suicide, and my mother is the one who found him. And that affected my life in various ways, but at that time, when I was 12 years old, I didn't really know how to handle that, because to me that was very, it was very stigmatizing, and suicide is very, has a huge stigma behind it. And I, I was very ignorant of what was going on through his life. And I'd say a lot of things about the mental health system within hospitals. And about two days before, my, my grandfather went into the hospital and saying how he was suicidal, they let him out. And then two days later, that's when he completed suicide. So I just want to say that was when I was 12 years old. And then, and then when my brother was 17, he was five years apart from me, he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. And at that time, I didn't know what paranoid schizophrenia was. 
to me, he was just my regular brother. I just, you know, he's very eccentric. He's very genuine, he's very passionate. And he, he, you know, he was my brother. And, and no matter how, you know, no matter what kind of negative things kind of happened in my family, um, I was always there for him. And I was never gonna leave his side. And about when I was, um, so throughout the years, from since I was 12 until I was about 22, I had to go through high school and all the things that happened in my life at home, I never really talked about when I was in high school. I never told my friends about it. I walked around, I was kind of popular, but it was really outgoing, but kind of the fact is I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really talk to anybody. And that was the one biggest thing that I should have done because maybe that would have helped me on my journey a little bit better. Um, so when I, I just want to, I'll jump to when I was, when I was about 22 years old, I was uh, about to wake up to go to school in York there, and I got this phone call at 6.30 in the morning. And when I got this phone call, my, my mom, she told me that my brother Adam uh, was missing. And I, you know, I was kind of freaking out. I didn't, I didn't really know what was going on. So what, kind of, what happened was my brother, he cut his wrist and he walked around the radius of my house about a kilometer in a circle to try and, I, I, don't know, I don't know what was going on, but it took, it took the, the police to find him in about in a, in a couple hours. It took. So then when they did find him, they took him to a hospital and he was going to be airlifted, but before that happened, I had to wait all day, all day long, for about six, seven hours, hoping that my brother was going to be okay. And you can imagine all the things that was kind of going through my mind at this time, worrying about my brother, whether he's going to be okay, and if, he, if he's going to make it. And then at about 6.30 p.m., it, you know, it was, it was a really, really weird feeling. I, I felt like something just kind of just left, just kind of left me. I don't know what it was, but I knew at that time that my brother was gone. And then at about 6.32, 6.33, my mom, she called me and she told me that my brother has died. And that time I fell to the floor, I was crying, I was, I was yelling why. It was, it was detrimental to my life and I, I it, it crushed me, it really did, to be honest. And um, for the next two years, I, I went through a spectrum of depression. I mean, every day I'd look into the mirror, I would cry, and I would also, at this time, I didn't want to give up university. I felt that I didn't want to stop. I think that was a, the best thing for me to do is to keep going, the street going forward, strive forward, and, and to not give up. But in, a, in another sense, that was kind of dangerous for me because I didn't allow myself to grieve. I didn't allow myself to kind of go through the motions instead of kind of pushing it back. And that was something that I, you know, I wish I kind of would head on with. So to say, so to speak. So then during that time, I want to tell you a little bit of something what happened at the funeral. What happened at the funeral at the wake, first off, there was about 200, 300 people pouring in and out of this place. So you can imagine how many people my brother affected in his lifetime. He touched so many people. Um, and, you know, you know, talking about it as, as, as kind of something that happened at the funeral, whether you can look at it as a huge circumstance, whether you can look at it as a miraculous event, but to me, it was hopeful. And I like to take a lot of positive things out of life, and I like to try and you know, get them up as much as possible. And so what happened was, and I wasn't really a religious or a spiritual person, but what happened was, you know, when, when me and the other pallbearers would take my brother out of the hearse, it started to miss rain. And then when it started to, and then when the priest started talking, it started to lightly rain. And then it started to rain even harder. And then it started to rain even harder. And then it started to hail. And then it started the snow. And then there's about 50 people all around with their hands cupped with perfect snowflakes. They're falling in their hand and everybody's looking around. They're like, what, what's going on right now? This is, this is really weird, right? And 
you know, and then the priest, he stopped talking, and when he stopped talking, the snow stopped, and then the sun seemed like it just shone down right on the grave, really weird, and then on the way back there was four rainbows. So that happened, and I, at the time I didn't really take that as something that was really meaningful, but in the end it, it, it is something meaningful. And I remember the priest turning around and kind of talking to me, and he said, you, you're going to be fine. He looked at me, and he, you know, he looked like he had a lot of confidence in his eyes. So, through this time of my depression, while I was going through my depression, I was looking through a lens of everything that was, it was all black and white to me. I was hopeless. I didn't have any motivation. I had a lot of the symptoms that Eric was talking about on the screen. I went through pure hell, and that's what it kind of felt like. Um, I, I didn't know how to pick myself back up again. And I, some of the things that really helped me go through what I went through was not only was it my music, because I, I really worked on my music hard, and I, I was halfway finished my album when my brother passed away, and I was really determined to kind of get myself rolling again and really finish that album. Because I felt like music was very ther therapeutic for me. It was a way to express myself, it was a way to be creative. And when you're depressed, you need something that's, you need a creative outlet. And that's, I can't, I, I can't tell you how much that really helped me in my journey. And so, not only was it the music that was helping me go through my depression, but it was also my social work. I was a client for the Hope team, from the Epi team, from CMHA. I was a client for them for about two years. And during that time, the one thing that really, well, a couple things that really helped me the most was having someone to sit there and just listen to. Because you, you can, you can go through life going to parties, having friends, doing all these things, but it's not like every day where you get to sit down with your friend, you know, and actually talk to each other about what's going on in your life. And that, that you can, and I, I know many of you probably happens where you don't really sit down and actually talk with, about what's going on through you. So, that's the one thing that really helped me a lot. And through that, and by getting better, by talking with my social worker, I was able to gather strength. And I realized that I wanted to do what this person was doing for me. I wanted to give back. I wanted to empower people like this person was empowering me. And it's easier said than done um, when, you have, when you went through a lot of the things that you go through. So after that happened to me, and after I, after I started going to, to school, my social worker, she, she kind of discharged me because she knew how well I was doing. So I went to school with the Santa. I did my placement at Canadian with the Health Association. And at that placement, I met a lot of interesting people. I empowered a lot of people. I got empowered by people. Because that's how the way it goes. You know, when I, when I work with people, they're empowering me, I'm empowering them. It's a two-way street, you know. It's, you give and you take, but you, you, you know, it's full circle kind of thing. But I just wanted to, but after that, I, I after finishing my placement, I, I worked at a residential support house and I, um, for autistic kids, and I learned a lot about them and how they communicate with each other. And I learned about other people who are diagnosed with bipolar and schizophrenia. And in a way, I kind of felt like I was at home because there's other people like me. And that was kind of making me feel a little bit better because I realized that there's a lot of people in the world that, you know, they're, 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 they're just kind of, they're similar. A lot of people are going through a lot of struggles just like I was, and it kind of, kind of brought things to the forefront of everything. So then, when the, when the job opening came up for CMHA, I applied and I got the job. There's a lot of things that I kind of think about at the time when my brother was going through what he went through. I, I remember telling my, I remember telling him, oh, you know, well, you're, you're schizophrenic. You're this, you're that. I put his label in front of the person who he, who he really was. I forgot about the person who he really was instead of really getting to know him. And the, you know, some of the some of the things that are 
you know, it really troubled me at first, but, you know, two months before my brother completed suicide, I found a note in his room, and it was to his unborn child. And what he said in the note, a couple of things, was be good to people. Be good to animals. You know, treat yourself well. It's positive things, but yeah, I remember, I remember just kind of like a thought just went through my head when I left that room. I remember asking myself, you know, I hope, hope my brother doesn't commit suicide. And you can imagine the guilt and the blame that I felt thinking that, like, I could have saved my brother's life. I could have said something. I could have done something, you know? And, but I, but after a while, I, I can't really blame myself. I can't really fill myself up with all this guilt because that wasn't, I didn't know the knowledge that I have now. I didn't know what I know now. I wish I, I wish, I wish I could go back in time and change the way that things were. But it's just not possible. And I want to, the way that I look at, at my own disability as being diagnosed with bipolar after being in the hospital for about three weeks. I forgot to mention that. But I was in there for three weeks. And while I went through psychosis, and I wanted to find what psychosis is in a simple, simple sense. It's uh, not being in touch with reality. And when I say that, what I experienced was thinking about aliens, thinking about religion, believing I was Jesus for a day. I thought about government conspiracies, government agents, invisible government agents. I, I, I took, I watched the TV and I was getting messages out of the TV. I was listening to the radio and I was receiving messages from the radio. I was nostalgic, I was getting a nostalgic feeling feeling like there was something that I was getting in touch with. And I was also thinking about angels and demons. I was thinking about all these things. But the, some of the things that I kind of take from it, I, don't, I choose not to look at what I went through as a negative experience. I choose to, to look at it as a positive experience, because that's the only way that I was able to get through what I went through. Now I'm kind of I realize that mental health in general shouldn't sometimes shouldn't at all really have this all this negativity surrounding around it. People need to talk more. People need to find meaning out of their experiences instead of talking about uh, talking putting lumping things into let's say hallucinations or delusions. These kind of these kind of words have a huge stigma situated with it. And when you, when you kind of put meaning into these experiences that these people have, to them it's real. To them it means a lot more than just a hallucination, a delusion, because those words kind of sound sick. They kind of sound that the person is sick. And I, I don't really believe that. I, don't, I choose not to believe them. And as a, as a mental health advocate, I want to grow as somebody who's going to be maybe teaching others to look at people who are diagnosed with disabilities to change the way of thinking because that's, that's the only way that we can kind of live through this, this life because we're all living the same, we're all living right now, we're all surviving and we have to take the, we have to take the best out of everything that we can because that's the only way we're going to survive. So, I'm, I'm an actor, and I'm a musician, I'm a mental health advocator, I'm a suicide survivor, I'm diagnosed with bipolar, I have all these other attributes, all these other characteristics who make me me, and one of my main things is I, I want to I empower individuals, I want to I wanna try and, if I, can, if I can save one life in my lifetime, that's, that's it. I've done my work. My, my life has been meaningful. There's been a purpose in my life to affect one person. And if I can, if I can save someone's life, that means that you know, the job's done. And everything else is just kind of like a bonus for me. And, I've, I've taken, and for me, being so you know, 
determined and ambitious and being empowered, this is the only this is the only way that I'm able to keep going the way I am. Because I'm trying to take everything positive of all the experiences that I've made, uh, that I've had. So that's that's I guess that's where I just want to end it here, and we can have some discussions. be the ones to contact us rather than the individual, right? Um, and, uh, you know, what what is um, sort of a, a, a challenge that we deal with with addictions and mental health is that there is a level of insight that is required for people to sort of undertake a recovery process. Um, so very often we will get referrals from family members or hospitals or agencies and the, the actual individual themselves isn't ready to do the work. Um, so what I can tell you is we often provide some psychoeducation right off the hop. So what I find is that very often people are discussing symptoms with me and don't even know that those symptoms are very normal for various issues. Um, so the first thing I want to do is give them some information about what I think might be going on. Um, the other thing that we often do is we offer to go with people to do things. So it would be helpful for you to go to somebody's GP with them. Because um, some people feel like when they get to the doctor's office, they can't speak. You know, they get nervous or they get sort of ashamed, and so it really helps if you're willing to go with them. What else? Also, inviting, and whenever you ask the question, are you feeling suicidal? Are you feeling, do you want to harm yourself? Like Eric was saying before, invite them into that conversation. Once you invite them in, you're opening up a whole new world. You're allowing them to speak. You're allowing them to open up. And that's the most important thing that you can do. Right, so, but, okay, uh, but, for example, people who are, they're seemingly really conscious of that, right? They have, they have, they are struggling with depression. Sure. And they're aware of it, so it's not, you know, it's super, and they're not willing to run or something, and not just, you know, get into the whole thing. Mm -hmm. You're saying that, you know, you offer these things, but do you have any kind of concrete examples Strategy. Sure. I mean, the other thing I would suggest is, is an information group or a support group. So find some other people that are also struggling with this issue. Uh, most of us uh, that are work at mental health agencies, we offer uh, family and caregiver information nights so that you can come and find out what symptoms uh, your family member is dealing with. Um, like, I'll give you a good example. Very often families will call us and say, my kid needs help. Um, you know, the, the, the young person gets sorted out, and then the parents say, well, he's gained 50 pounds from antipsychotics. So what are you gonna do about that? And so we have to sort of say, that's, that's part of the package here about how this person is getting well. And so, um, for instance, letting families know that it's not helpful to comment on weight gain <coughs> when people are on medications. Um, the other thing that I would do in that scenario is maybe ask some questions like, um, what do you think you're struggling with 
to get you towards treatment. So have people start to self-identify what the barriers are. So if that is, I don't know where to go, or I don't know who to ask, or I don't want to do inpatient, or I only want to do outpatient, or I want to be seen in the evening, like whatever the barrier is, see if you can help them move past that. Um, with our work, we often go to see people in their homes because the very first barrier is they can't get out of their house. Um, so if the, you know, what I do in my work is try to find um, service professionals that will meet the needs, the unique needs of clients around actually accessing a service. So if that means we go to home, we also do Tim Hortons, we go to the mall, we sit in parks. Um, so outreach is really good if you can get somebody from an agency to come in and see them. Um, and the other thing I would say, I don't know if you agree with me, but I mean it's sort of like recovering from an addiction. You, you almost need a few days of feeling well to figure out how ill you were. Um, and that's sort of part of the healing process is that you're able to sort of go, whoa, I didn't realize what kind of risk I was in. Um, and so sometimes if we can get people to agree to sort of undertake and sort of sit with it for a few days, they'll start to feel some actual relief, which can be helpful. And also, I tell some of my clients too, I, I tell them, if you're feeling well one day, just and you're feeling sick, uh, for a, you know, for a couple days afterwards, I always remind them: remember the time when you were feeling well, and remember that you're it's not going to be forever; it's only going to be temporary, and you will get through this. Because a lot of people that I talk to, you know, whether they're diagnosed with schizophrenia or they're going through the symptoms of uh, bipolar, um, and even with my own issues, I always have to remind myself that you know this is just temporary; it's gonna, you know, it's gonna be okay. Right? That helpful, yeah. Um, when it comes to uh, male depression and suicide, I think uh, one of the biggest factors is the stigma, yeah. um, especially for men. And uh, a lot of men will just like shut down and, and they have a huge wall and you can't, you can't get through there. You know? And uh, um, how do you approach a situation like that? I mean. Once people find out you have a uh, depression, they stay away yeah. from you, right? Yeah, for sure. Now, for women, it's different because women, they, they seem to get more assistance and they're more open about it. But for men, it's a totally different world. So yeah, you... women start reporting as early as teens, two thirds as often as men. Um, so there's a we have been socialized somewhere along the line where it's okay for us to ask for help and it's not okay for you guys, and somehow it's um, a reflection of your masculinity or your power, or your strength, right? Um, so we do, uh, the other issue in the field is that it's hard to find men clinicians to work with. Social work, uh, medicine is really quite dominated by females. So I often have men who come in and say, like, you're lovely, but I don't want to work with you, right? And so we have to try to find someone like Julian to do the work. Um, I would say that, uh, have we done a men specific Work? There has been in the past that they quit. I don't think recently. Yeah, I mean, we we have found in in gender the gender approaches are really important for both groups. Um, like, there's only two genders. Sorry, I didn't mean to apply that. But uh, currently, there are only two streams of gender, right? And so, um, uh, so we try to um, we try to talk about the things that are important to men in their process, which can often be different from women's experiences. The other thing that happens with men more often is what we find is that men externalize their pain much more often. So we see it in the form of um, assaults or domestic violence or addiction or um, self-injury or that kind of thing, whereas women tend to internalize the process. So we see corresponding to that, we see often eating disorders, um, self-injury pieces, um, so, uh, we definitely acknowledge and recognize the difference when we're doing work with people. And, uh, and, and, and getting male perspective, in the social service work, I remember going to school and I was, there was only three out of 120 wow. students in that program and there was only three males. Mm -hmm. And you gotta, you gotta think. In the, 
that there's got to be there's in social service work and social work, you know, it's starting, but it, it you need more males for just that reason to to be a, like male from male male with kind of camaraderie, kind of just you know. And the young men are definitely reporting that that we speak to is that they are frustrated by the lack of uh, adult men to act in mentorship capacities and. Um, engagement in um, normalization of emotional sort of language and conversation. Um, it feels like it, it's interesting because I work in the schools quite a bit, and there, I mean, there's a, there's an interesting shift happening. One of the things that I see all the time now is guys hugging, uh, which is you know wasn't my experience as a kid. I have a 12 year old son and a 15 year old son who both do it, and I said to them one day, like, what's that about? Like, is that okay now for you guys to be? soft with each other and they were like, yeah. like we're, you know, and I was like, well, that's interesting. So, I mean, I'm, I, I really am impressed with the comments from um, the boys and men that we get as well. Um, and I had a really nice experience recently where a dad who was very concerned about his son came in to get care for him and, and we had a very nice conversation about um, the pressures of being a father and the pressures of being a son and being, a, and being men. It's mainly, it's mainly the, the thing about just letting go of that, that thing about being weak, you know, the, 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 to explain your feelings, to, to, to discuss with somebody your, what's going on in your life, being, being emotional, is, yeah, that's the whole stigma of just that. Yes, um, question about That's not my understanding of our, our legal obligation. It's health care, not criminality. So I'm not, I have no interest in criminalizing somebody for a suicide attempt. And by the way, I dealt with at least 10 charges uh, on 10 different people in courts for suicidal actions. Um, and uh, so I have a few recommendations. The, the first thing is in Toronto, there's a number 808-2222, which is the direct line to the police dispatch. It means you can <coughs> bypass 911 and you can specifically request the mental health um, and justice team. Uh, here in Ontario now, we have plain closed officers that have received some mental health training. Um, they show up at the person's house in an unmarked car without lights and sirens, with no uniforms. They try to negotiate getting that person to the hospital if they feel like that's the appropriate action. Um, if the person refuses, then they can up the ante and bring the, the, the ambulance. If the person does need to be restrained, we could use the police. Um, I mean, the, 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 the bottom line is the danger to yourself or others. Um, that's also, I mean, people say things all the time, right? Like, oh, I want to kill my kids, right? Um, does that, is that an example of when we call? No. Um, but what you should know is that if you are apprehended under the Mental Health Act in Ontario currently, it shows up on your vulnerable sector screening and your police check. So what that means is we've had hundreds of cases at the Canadian-US border this year where people have gone, they have opened this document, found out that they have a mental health apprehension and refused them entry into the US. So it generates a record. So my advice is always if you can physically get that person to the hospital or a crisis center, that's my first pick. First pick. And if you have somebody who's absolutely unwilling to go to the hospital because of trauma or previous experience at the hospital, I think that's a valid position as well. It's just how do we set up safety for that person in the next 24 hours, 48 hours, right? And there's forms, right? There's you know, form threes where you know you have to talk to the is it the justice system or is it you have to talk to the if you go to the Justice of the Peace with a form two and you can uh, make an application as a family member or a friend, give the Justice of the Peace information about what you consider the risk. If they agree with you, they would issue a form two. And if you want a form one, you can go to any family doctor and express your concerns. And if they agree with you, they will sign the form one. You take the person with that to the hospital and they're admitted. I have a bunch of questions if you don't mind. Um, so we can do it. 
Yeah, I, I want to ask you about those 10 cases that you were involved with and the police may play charges. Uh, based on gender, and I would assume that most of those were men who were charged, uh, and what was the outcome of those? And the next part of this question is, how often do, does each gender complete suicide as opposed to not complete suicide? I don't know, like fail the test, you mean? I don't even think we have that number because there's so many that aren't reported. Even, I mean, even with our suicide stats, what they are, as bad as they are, we're not even, we don't even really have the full picture, right? Because families hide suicides all the time, like, it's not reported as a suicide. There are, there are numbers, though, for, for people who don't report. Somehow, people find out how many assaults go unreported. We don't yeah. know how many suicides, uncompleted or failed suicides. And secondly, the last part of the question is knowing that there's a discrepancy based on gender, what's the CMHA do about addressing that? Are you doing anything? How do you stop from doing something? Okay. Let's go with the first one. <laughs> yes, mostly men charged. Um, outrageous charges in my opinion. Uh, we do have mental health processes in the court right now, but in uh, in one gentleman's case, they charged him with, um, so what he did to, to in his attempt to suicide was he, uh, he sped up and he drove his car into the back of a garbage truck. And they weigh, you know, whatever, five tons, right? So he did an enormous amount of damage to his car his legs were wrecked, um, he lived. Um, nobody in the garbage truck was injured because it weighs five tons, so they didn't even feel him. Um, and they charged him with all sorts of charges that would involve him losing his license, uh, which is in fact what happened. So you can imagine, like you're already dealing with depression and suicidality and now you can't use your car to go to the doctor or the hospital or your shrink, right? Um, and then a young man that I dealt with he kept calling and trying to get admitted into the hospital. They refused to admit him. He took a kitchen knife, he sliced his arms, panicked, went out into traffic to get help. So he's pouring blood, he's 17 years old, and he's holding the knife still, and they charge him with possession of a uh, concealed weapon. Um, and one of, another gender specific thing that I can think of is a couple of years at South Lake, a young man was admitted for suicidality, and they didn't medically restrain him or physically restrain him, and because of his size, he managed to jump through the window at the hospital and complete a suicide on a psychiatric ward. Um, and that's like those kinds of things. I'm like, what? Why wouldn't you be watching him? Why wouldn't you? Um, and in terms of what CMHA is doing. I don't think that men are a priority uh, listed in our uh, three-year plan, if I had to be honest with you. The Mental Health Commission of Canada has identified uh, youth, elderly, there's five main focuses for the Canadian National Mental Health Strategy, and I don't know that men are one of those five. Uh, women presumably have more eating disorders than men. Have they identified? Uh, historically, women had much more. Currently, men are um, following in in the race quite uh, extensively. We've never had more male eating disorders than we have right now. Hmm. And I think the stat that I use in my eating disorder is that forty three percent of boys under the age of seventeen reported that they were unhappy with their appearance. Um, so we're, we are seeing like real changes in that kind of work. Um, oh, sorry, you, you went away. Oh, yes. uh, oh, sorry. You then you. So I heard that in Europe they have a different model. Um, people who have no tolerance for. Uh, continuing to live life and their issues become extremely severe uh, and they're suffering and uh, I heard that in, in Europe it's legal to uh, uh, visit a doctor who injects something in you to die calmly in peace 
And I'm not sure if this model made it to Canada or if it's something that is well set. Europe and Australia are kicking our butts with new therapeutic models. There's no question. The best stuff coming out for a variety of issues is coming out of Europe and Australia. It hasn't happened here, and, and the only place that I know of it in the U.S. right now is the state of Oregon, who offers people um, a pill that they can take home and take when they would like to. Um, but it's a really good question, and it's one that people avoid left, right, and center. And so what we often have is people having pretty awful suicides because they don't have access to stuff like that. Yeah. Oh, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. I over. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so besides the obvious reason of men not being able to express themselves um, as women do, what are some of the other reasons why men are more likely to commit suicide? What we know is that we have really high levels of PTSD in the male communities based on uh, wars. Uh, so currently in the US, two thirds of the homeless population are war veterans. Um, so we have immense uh, breakdowns of people's um, strength and health as a result of PTSD. Um, the other thing is one of our colleagues um, has been part of a whole movement um, to sort of expose how much child sexual abuse happens to boys and how little that's been talked about. Um, and in relationship with specifically male identified um, activities, so where we're hearing a lot about uh, sexual abuse now is in sport uh, teams, etc. cetera. Um, and um, what, what else would you say to that? Even even having like having disabilities uh, such as like you know schizophrenia or bipolar you know even like for me going through the three weeks of you know, hospitalization and going through psychosis um, that that for me was very uh, big and I and it's just not telling anybody it's it's basically it's and having the having the stigma surrounding around people who who are being told that they're this, told that they're that, you know, told that you know, oh, you're you're going to be violent, or you know, sometimes that's not the case. The case is that the the people who are diagnosed with these things, they're the ones that are the victims of violence more so than the people that are the ones being violent. And it's all these stigmas of surrounding. It really has a big, huge toll on the effect of these people, and I think that's being overseen. It's, you know, that's, that's one big factor, too. Oh, sorry. I'm behind one. So, in general, in the case of, like, suicide, uh, mainly caused by, like, um, like other people uh, could bully or mistreat this person would cause this person. Good question. So the question is, uh, you know, what's the main cause of how people get suicidal? Is it a, sort of a result of bullying? Uh, like being mistreated. Yeah. So I mean, I, I think you, I think you've got it. I think that trauma is a component of that. I think sometimes mental illness is a component of that. If you're experiencing hallucin hallucinations or delusions, uh, they can. Uh, really confuse your neurology and, and make you paranoid and um, uh, and there was one other um, and the other thing is that uh, that's sort of male specific is what we find with men is that you guys tend to think about the possibility of suicide and act on it quick quicker than women do um, so there's there's an impulse piece with guys um, that's slightly different so um, but, I mean, in terms of, there isn't one reason. It's a whole variety of reasons. Um, and if you are experiencing a clinical depression, you're actually having thoughts that sort of tell you that it's better to be dead. So which gender is like more like extra, like externalized, more, more likely to share the thoughts and get help and like, who would more likely like, have a thought, more likely to seek immediate help? 
Yeah, except we see the opposite. We don't hear from men very often. We often meet men at critical places, like in the midst of a, a divorce or a family court matter. Um, we often will see men who will ask for treatment if they've been arrested for a DUI or a domestic. Um, so often we will have men come into service in a different sort of way, rather than direct. of social work uh, policy has really been generated by advocacy within the field and so I think for those of us that are queer we've we've moved the gay and lesbian perspective further in and and we've, we've spent a long time addressing sort of cross-cultural issues and anti-oppression and anti-racism and I suspect that there haven't been enough guys in the, the field to, to get together and put some pressure from that perspective Yeah, absolutely. For gay males, males to be helped. So imagine how difficult it is to get you know, hetero heterosexual men to 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 counsel all the heterosexual men. Yeah. Absolutely. And and you know what really what the one of the things that men hear over and over and over again when they go for service is you should take anger management. Yeah. You should take anger management. That's the problem of all men. You're all angry, and we can just ignore all the trauma and all the abuse, and you know, uh, and 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 it's uh, it's nonsense. So it'd be, it'd be cool to see that you know, that statistic account and then more of the sort of you know, more things that men to feel like if it goes okay, I can really men to be bad this information. I can deal with. I think we're certainly willing to take back to CMHA that we've heard that that's a piece of the agenda that's missing. Um, and this has been a good process for me in terms of that piece of learning. Uh, I just had... Sorry. Sorry. Um, how, would you, like, how would you advise someone to approach your friend or family member, someone who is obviously depressed, has been for a very long time, has hold themselves up in their, their room, not even their house, just their room, but has delusions about the people around them, paranoia about everyone in their family, in their lives, their friends. How do you approach that person trying to get them to change maybe some part of their lifestyle, get help without becoming part of their delusions? Uh, I think in that kind of a scenario, it's you might be getting to a point of forming somebody. I, 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 I mean, if somebody's paranoid, if somebody's having delusions, um, and you are going to become part of that, and it's very hard when the illness is at work for them to believe you. And plus, when, you, when you're going through that too, you don't realize yeah. that you're going through it at the time. Like you, you, you just think that you're having all these experiences, and you, whether you're have feelings of paranoid or being have feelings of grandeur, and, like you just don't. Yeah, they, they at the time just don't know, and sometimes it takes other people to intervene, and sometimes have form twos. Now, when you say to inform somebody, that be a medical professional or somebody else in the family. 
Uh, sorry, to form someone means to apply for a form under the Mental Health Act. Right. So a form one, two, or three, which will uh, allow for a 72-hour period of assessment. At the end of that 72 hours, there's a process where they can extend that, but, but that person will have the ability to uh, fight or to appeal that decision. Um, so there's, there's protection in the Mental Health Act for those who are apprehended, but also for the rest of us who need to get people apprehended. Thank you. Am I supposed to stop? No. Yeah. There's one more. One more? Okay, okay. How do you find someone who's homeless in the grid in Toronto? Sorry? How do you find someone who's homeless who's off the grid in Toronto? Um, I would call the street outreach ban. Um, they have the most one-on-one -on -one contact uh, all night long with people who are street involved. Um, and the other place I might call is uh, Andayan, uh, which is a First Nation, I don't know how to spell it, like that? No, I'm just kidding, I don't know. Um, uh, and Fred Victor Center uh, are all three sort of hubs um, for uh, individuals who are homeless. And often, many of the drop-ins will take a message for you and put it on their message board. So if your loved one comes into the center, they may be in the habit of checking to see if anyone's left them something. Um, if there are any more questions, I have one more. It came on on Twitter uh, for the Canadian Mental Health Association, and the question was, what is your view on publishing about specific cases given the concern for copycat um, actions, I guess. Um, there is some research around suicide contagion, is what it's called, and they have had experiences in certain towns, cities, uh, or institutions where they will have an outbreak of suicidality. Uh, it, it, it tends to be something that happens with younger people versus older people, so they're more sort of suggestible. Um, and in a situation like that, um, you would want to call your local mental health agency and get some support around how to uh, manage that situation. Uh, but, I mean, in terms of does writing about suicide or talking about suicide generally tend to create contagion? No. Uh, we, we have really only seen those situations in sort of uh, limited ways. We haven't seen that, uh, we haven't seen the risk go up around having the conversation on the table. So your view is to talk about it more plainly would be uh, more ideal? Talk, talk, talk. Talk about suicide. Go home. Have a conversation with your kids about suicide. Have a conversation with your parents about suicide. You know, elderly suicide rates are really high right now in Canada, for instance. So have the conversations, and all you need to do in your family is decide that it's not a conversation of stigma, and boom, stigma's gone, right? We can all get comfortable with this topic, with this word. Um, and internationally, it's three million people that die a year in the world from suicide. And to me, that's an outrage. So I really encourage you to talk, talk, talk. You, you reach out one person, that one person is going to talk to two people, that two people yeah. can turn to four and the eight, and it's going to keep on going. So what is it? It's up to you guys. It's up to other health professionals. It's up to everybody. Just keep on working on it. Are there any more questions? Um, Jeff? Um, I found it interesting. I'm pretty sure you said that you aren't aware of any reliable stats on suicide attempts. No, no, I just oh. don't know them. Okay. There may be reliable ones. Because I've heard a few times that uh, women are four, time, four times as often or four times as likely to attempt suicide. And that if you combine that with the male suicide rate, it would mean that so it's around 15, 20 times, men are about 15 or 20 times uh, more effective or efficient they at, are. Kill, at killing themselves, which they is are. about as dramatic a, different, a gender difference I've ever seen. There's you, different suicide methodology by gender, which is very interesting. So uh, men often will use guns and bridges, which are pretty uh, quick resolutions, right? Women often will use self-harm and pills, uh, which have vaguer outcomes depending on how much, how deep 
all of that. So it, 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 it is interesting. Uh, Health Canada does have a section on suicide, which may have this question that you asked about the number of attempts versus completions. Um, I just don't know if I've ever even sort of looked for information in that sort of context. Um, I was trying to give you, oh, uh, the World Health Organization has an amazing page on suicide um, and has it broken down by genders and cultures and ethnicities and geography and, and you may be able to find that information there. The other thing we can do is if we can find it, we can pass it on to you guys to distribute later. For me, the main cause of the depression is losing the meaning in life. So, um, I have, I think myself, I have this thought. So, what can you find the meaning in life? Mm, that's a good question. Find the meaning in life? Um, you know, I think, first off, talking about it with other people, but I think you have to be in more involved with trying things that are new expressing yourself, finding something that you can find pleasure in, in terms of, for me it was really music, and I really embellished in that, and I really just took that and I kind of just went with it, because the way for me is able to get my frustration, my sadness, even my happiness, like sometimes I was happy, sometimes, and just kind of just letting it, letting it go, finding something for you to find pleasure in, and just really, because eventually we all do have a meaning, and you will find your, your, your time when you will get the, your purpose in life. And even just being here, that means, that's meaning something for you. I mean, just take the little things out of life and really just notice them, be aware of them, and they will, you'll start being affected by them. And try and look at the positive things and don't focus on the negative things so much, just be aware of them. And that's, that's the one thing I can do, because when I was going through depression, I definitely thought, Things are going to be like this forever. Things are never going to change. But then it's, you can put things in a thousand different perspectives. You can look at things a thousand different ways. It's just all about which path you choose to take. You know what I mean? Um, sorry, something that uh, Julia made me think of as well is, is um, you know, we, Part of mindfulness work, which is what we're really spending a lot of time on now, uh, mindfulness has a, a basic principle, which is gratitude. So literally waking up and being grateful that your lungs are filled with air today. But they, it also has some other features that are really lovely, which includes like one of the tenets of mindfulness is seeing the world through childlike eyes. And that's a really interesting experience if you go out and try to see things like you've never seen them before, like you're doing it all over again. And uh, mindfulness uses all sorts of things like walking meditation where you take your, your shoes and your socks off and you walk um, in the grass and you walk on pavement and you feel what that feels like. Um, and, and the other thing that I think is really helpful about mindfulness is that you, stop, you start to learn how to not spend half your day in the past and half your day in the present, which is where most of our misery lies. Um, and you start to get really focused on here and now. And so do I have everything I need right now? Am I fed? And do I have you know, something to drink? Do I have something to stay warm? And if I do, then I'm okay right now. Um, so I would encourage you. Jack Kornfield is an amazing mindfulness teacher. Um, Tara Brack, and they run Tara Brack groups here in Toronto called Radical Acceptance. Um, and uh, there's amazing podcasts right now for free on iTunes uh, for Jack Kornfield, Pema Chodron, Tara Brack, which are all about mindfulness and, and cognitive pieces to help reframe your experience. And also, um, uh, Involved, like when it's, it's really hard sometimes when, to get involved in other people's problems, and sometimes that really affects in you. And taking a quote from uh, something, you know, maybe not a quote, but something about Robin Williams about how he tried to make everybody happy. And sometimes when you try to make everybody happy, you end up being the most loneliest person in the world, right? You might end up really taking on, like, having the world on your shoulders, right? So having self care for yourself, caring about yourself, putting you first in front of everybody else is really important too. And then go out and share your experience uh, and help others, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but that's yeah. that's what inspires me now, yeah. is that I'm able to share my learnings 
Um, and, and that I learned so many things from other people who had already recovered from depression that helped. Um, I think that peers, each other, were just as good as any medical model has to offer. So get some support, find some other people, and share your experience. Any more questions? Okay, so before we close, I just want to um, remind each of you to please sign up with me or up front for emailed invites to our uh, events. Um, also, if you have not done so already, we suggest a $5 donation for your attendance today. Um, please donate at reception up front to help us reconcile our event costs and to um, help us continue these important public talks. Finally, we invite you to, the, uh, to come out tomorrow to the Halloween party at the Canadian Center for Men and Families um, from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, check out their website, www.menandfamilies.org. You can go there and find out um, details about how to get there. Um, on their site, and uh, they're located at 152 Carlton Street, Unit 201. And uh, lastly, please um, join me in thanking Julian and Ara for coming tonight on behalf of the Mental Canadian Mental Health Association and being here to talk to us about such an important topic. So thank you, Julian. <laughs>